It's king of music. Yeah, look, look. Last time that I checked, Christ still reigns. If I die for the gospel, I'ma still gain. Last time that I checked, I could call him direct. We are not a gang, but don't mess with my set. Last time that I checked, let me dissect. Christ cut the noose, Satan had on my neck. Last time that I checked, told the devil, get the check. I'ma need payback for everything he wrecked. Last time that I checked, Christ never took a L. Eternity is long, boy, you better book it well. Last time that I checked, KMF still winning souls. Passing out the bread of life, hit us for the dinner rolls. Every time I check, we win in the battle. I got my kids in the battle. I ain't a sideline Christian, boy, I get in the battle. I check, 100 mil on my neck. That's what they say. Gucci on the wrist, so how did I guess? I checked, and they talking about the same old thing tell my god snatch you up like it ain't no thing i checked and you should fear god surround yourself with homies that'll help you hear god last time that i check i don't do it for a check i seek to please god i don't need your respect last time did i check christ coming soon to trample on satan boy it ain't nothing new last time did i check you should give your life to him you ain't getting into heaven if you like the sin i checked and eternity is real saved at 15 fire burning in me still last time did i check you know we keep the truth in the music i'm in the booth got a tool for the truth and we use it i check kingdom music we some anti-soldiers and i don't recommend you go against my soldiers i check my guy he can use whoever give your life to christ we can do this together i check christ still reigns if i die for the gospel i still gain last time did i check Psalms is written clear. The Lord is my strength, I have no fear. His presence surrounds me ever near. The young dogs ready for the fight. The word is our sword shining bright. When the enemy attacks, we stand secure. God's promise lives forever pure. To the valleys and the canyons. In the canyons we ride, we got on our side, we won't be denied in the face of danger. We hold our ground with a righteous fury, we scream it loud. serve the Lord, we will serve the Lord, walk in faith, never straying off the road, in a world so cold where the darkness pours, we stand strong in His name, our hearts all aboard, we ain't chasing the fame, no we're chasing the fine, every step we take, guided by heavenly signs with the armor of God, in a world full of chaos, confusion is supreme, we stay within the truth, stand against every scheme, we're the young brothers and as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord is my strength, I have no fear.
You can do better than that. Come on, let's praise the Lord together. Come on, let's clap our hands. Come on. Set, set, one, two, mic check. Can you hear me?
You can do better. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, are you breathing tonight? Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God a praise one more time. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands all over the house. Generation falling down to worship, they sing the song for it in the land. All who come before us and all who will believe to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name. It's the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. Oh, 
in dominions of power and positions your name stands above and all and the angels cry holy the creation cries holy you are lifted high Come on, let's get God to praise. Hallelujah.
voice of many waters in song of heaven thrown louder than the thunder make your glory known you guys know it come on hail hail lion of judah let the lion roar hail hail lion of judah let the lion roar hail hail lion of judah come on i don't think they can hear you up in heaven
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, my God. That was amazing. That was amazing. Let's open up in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us to praise your name today, Lord. For letting us be here today to witness and to hear the words that you have to say for us today, Lord Jesus. Let us go out after today. Let us go out into tomorrow and the next week prepared for war. Open our ears today, Lord. Open our hearts today to hear the words that you want us to hear. Let the Spirit in, Lord Jesus. Change lives today, Lord Jesus. Lord, open our hearts today, Lord. Let us learn something. Let us ingrain something in our souls today, Lord Jesus. Woo! I didn't feel it until I came up here. I was back there doing the sound, and I was just clicking away at all the buttons. Then I hit the I hit the platform and the Holy Spirit hit me. I, I feel like I'm wading in water right now. Oh my I'm usually on that side, I'm not used to this. I'm feeling pretty good. Let's do that one more time, huh? Let's go one more time with that bird. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Get up.
machine's not even on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, so this is what we're doing tonight. Um, whew. I just need a second. I just need a second. Heart rate's real high. That's good. That's I gotta lose weight for sure for my praise like that. That's, that's a fact. Alright, listen, uh, we got a great night tonight. Pastor Chad is preaching. Come on. Come on. You know, I, I didn't know how much I liked Pastor Chad's preaching until he preached about two young guns ago. And um, I'm in the back, and I'm doing the scriptures, and I'm just sort of, when you're back there, you're pushing buttons, you're, you're paying attention, but it's sort of tangential, you know? You're not really in it, you just want to make sure everything goes, goes well. And I remember, I think I, I forgot the last four scriptures, because the Lord hit me like a ton of bricks. He hit me so hard, he taught me something in that moment. And, and the screens were completely black. And you know what? No one complained, so it was okay. Um, after that, we're going to have Sergio Sanchez. Come on. Um, give me a soundtrack for walking. Ready? Okay. okay. I need to take these guys home. Okay, so um, we also have an announcement. Like I said yesterday, we got a special announcement. This Young Guns event, for people that have been here all three nights, or at least two nights, it's been awesome. The Lord, the Lord has been moving. The Spirit has fallen. The anointing has been here. It's, it's amazing. This is not the last time we're going to do this. This is not the last time we're going to have an event. This is not the last time we're all going to be together, working, praying, praising, learning, fellowshipping. That said, we have Kingdom Builders coming up April 22nd. Sorry. I'm still, I'm just, I'm still a little woozy. Uh, May 22nd. May 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and I got a trailer for you. It's a little teaser. Kick it old school, guys. Dennis and 
we realize we got people from all corners of the planet coming here. So it's officially a world conference. And if you haven't been to a Kingdom Builders event, you're missing out. It is amazing. It's amazing and you don't want to miss it. And tomorrow at 10 a.m., Pastor? Thank you. At 10 a.m. here, after everything's been cleaned up, that's going to be a nice long night. We're going to have a Kingdom Builders rally. And that rally, we're going to have food, we're going to have beverages, we're going to have fellowship, we're going to talk about what's happening, how you can be involved, and we hope you can come out to that. <coughs> Don't miss it. Okay, come on. Come on now. Uh, also, we got shirts in the back, and we got uh, Pastor Sergio has a QR code. You scan it, and it, you can buy some of his merchants too. Support the ministry. Support uh, Sergio Sanchez. Support Praise Chapel Tustin. And get some cool swag while you're at it. Okay. All right, I got Hector, you got to come up here because I need a break, dude. I, I'm telling you, I hit the pl- Everything was fine. I'm ready to go. Energy. I hit the platform and it was like walking through sand. It was like walking through sand. Jeez. Praise the Lord. Amen. We got a special guest that we want him here all the time. His name is the Holy Spirit. Say hello, Holy Spirit. Amen. He's been in the house, and I'll tell you what, it's been exciting. I love it when we come together and we praise the Lord together. And I believe this is what he wants to do. There's something fresh in this conference that he's doing. And you know what? I desire this every day when we come together. Because when we come together, there's something that changes our hearts, something that changes our attitude. I mean, you know what? You come up here and you feel the Holy Spirit. And tonight we want to invite you that you would come up here because God wants to do something special tonight. I really believe it. You know, this conference didn't happen just because it happened. I believe there's been people that have been praying for this conference. And prayer makes a difference. Tomorrow we, we join together at 830 to pray. And I'll tell you what, if you haven't been praying, we invite you. I don't know what time or what time of the day you spend praying, but I'll tell you what, that's the key to revival. I, I pray I pray that this this conference will go on for the next few weeks. I mean, I want that. I'm waiting for revival. I'm waiting for a change. Amen. And we, we, we just got to keep inviting the Holy Spirit to come and move and do some things. Amen. Tonight we have some testimonies of what happened last night. We got Sister Hilda. Sister Hilda here. There she is. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everybody. It is such a blessing to see every single one of you guys here. For all, everybody that's been here all three nights, last night was like, whew. I've been crying all day because the Lord just want to testify that he's real. Jesus is real. When I saw my daughter praising God, worshiping him, and coming up to the altar, that was like, thank you, Lord. That's one of my answer prayers. Don't stop praying because he is real. He answers your prayers. Maybe not today, not tomorrow, but he will. It's his timing, not ours. You know, and I, I pray for all my family my to see them where, where you guys are at, and it will happen. And I just want to encourage you guys to keep coming. You know, this is it's a blessing to see everybody here and praising God, and, well, what a worship. Just We want to see this every two weeks, <laughs> every day. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. And then we got Sister Christina. Christina, come on up. Amen. Man, what an awesome time in the Lord have we had here. Um, you know, coming to this conference, when my husband said, oh, we're going to do another conference, I was like, oh. <laughs> you know? And so sometimes we were, um, this time we were worshiping at the beginning of uh, the conference, Wednesday and, and Thursday, and there was a song that really ministered to me because it's true. You know, we're all, you know, a lot of us know the Lord, some of us don't. But the ones that know the Lord break my religion, 
right? Break my religion. We were asking the Lord to come break our religious spirits, amen? And not only our religious spirits, but some of us have, how many of you, if you come from a Latino family, you guys have traditions, right? We, all, we have a lot of tradition, Latino families. I know different cultures have different um, traditions, but that's another thing that we have to ask the Lord to break. Break all those, those re religion and break tradition because sometimes we could get stuck in a staleness of, of our, in our relationship with the Lord, a staleness where we're not allowing God to move. We're just doing the same thing over and over and over. And this broke my religion because three days in a row when you have to work full time and you're a parent, and I commend each and every person that came out here all three nights, and even the ones that just showed up maybe one or two nights, it, it takes breaking out of your comfort zone to get here to, for what the Lord wants to do in your life. But we have to allow him to break that tradition, break that religion, and don't just stop today. No, not just, oh, the conference is over, let's stop. No, we have to keep going. We have to keep on breaking those traditions and those mindsets and those barriers that keep us from the will of God. Amen? So that's what I got out of this conference. I'm so grateful um, to, the, to the Holy Spirit because he's the one that's in control here. Amen? So God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then we got Brother Joshua. Brother Joshua, you're in the house. There you go. How you doing, Phil? So, you know, it's it's crazy to me. Like, I've done a lot of traveling. Uh, time. And the thing is, uh, coming here, it's really set home. And the thing is, um, as much as I've bared my cross, I just need to remember I can lay it down and say, there at Jesus' feet, but I don't need to forget my sin. And that repentance is so real. You know, um, I really have to hate the Lord. I've carried a cross miles and miles constantly. Uh, if I could just do, if this testimony touches one person, it's going to be me. This is the way it's so worth it. You know, coming to these places and seeing sharing your experiences and how they just change your story with the Lord. Um, it, it just, it's such a blessing. And I just thank you all for coming here. Amen. Amen. You know, he's so loud back there that I'm going to invite him to come up. Our pastor, Pastor Dennis, come on up. Amen. Share a little bit. Jesus loves you. Who wants to stay till midnight? The food will last till tomorrow. Brother Jess will sleep on the sawdust over here. Amen. This is amazing. I am so, so proud of all of you guys. I am really pumped. I'm like, I think I'm going to get saved. Amen. Is there somebody else in the house that likes to testify? Raise up your hand. Brother Stephen, come on up. Yeah, you... You know, I ain't giving up my shot. Um, it, it is, <laughs> it's definitely a blessing to be here and um, just to be able to see everybody that I don't get to see all the time. You know, um, God's done a ma marvelous work in my life, in my family's life. It says you and your household will be saved. And me and my whole household is saved now. My wife's delivered. I'm delivered. And it's the power of God that has got a hold of me. And I just can't um, help but tell everybody everywhere that I go, you know, to be that bright light in the dark place. Amen. And I uh, just want to thank Pastor Dennis and, and Pastor Chase most of all. You know, he's, uh, he's put me under his wing and he's really showed me the way. I love Pastor Chase. I give him honor. And I just thank you, Jesus, for putting him in my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, the reason why we do these conferences, it's not for us. It's for all of you. Because you know what's happening in the world today? The Bible says that men will lose their love. Ain't that what's happening today? You know, I see many people that run out of gas. Nobody stops for them, but I do. I don't care if they're a killer or not. I'm going to help them. 
Amen. Because that's my opportunity to talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, many people are losing their passion. And that's why we invite you to come out to this, because we want you to get that fire back in your heart. Because I'll tell you what, God, God is up to something. We believe that this year, 24 is more of Christ Jesus. That's what we believe, that God got more for us. And Lord, as the things keep going and keep approaching, we're starting to see the signs. If you don't see them, you need to open up your eyes. Because God wants to save you from what's coming. Amen? So I'm looking at many men that are losing their passion. They're going away from the church. They're losing their lives with that uh, drug that's going around with fentanyl. I know men of God that have been in a home and have died because of fentanyl. And you know, there's many of them. So we need to get back out there. You know, we lost it a little bit where we don't go out into the streets anymore. We need to get back to the streets. Because right here, we're, we're, we're receiving what God has for us. But it's not for just nothing. It's for us to go out there and preach the gospel, amen? And when you do that, we're going to see the signs and wonders that he speaks about. But first, we got to do what he said to do. Go out there and preach the gospel. Save those that are dying, amen? So we need to continue to do that. So don't give up. Let there be a new fire in your life tonight. And you know what I don't like is that when we do a conference, we let two, three days go by, and we go back to the same old rut, Amen? We can't have the same old rut anymore. We need to be in love. I, said, I spoke last night about not just being a believer. There's too many believers, but there's not enough lovers. We need to love Jesus more and more. He makes a difference. He made a difference in my life. You know, I, I'm trying to do things today by myself because I lost my wife. It's going to be three years. But you know what? God's been faithful to me. God's been there. You know that song that we've been singing for the last three nights, He Will Never Fail? Three nights... I have heard that song. I want you to know that he's telling you he's not going to fail you. He's right here for you. Amen. So we want to give a thanks to Pastor Dennis, also for the pastors that have come, for those who have spoken, and Brian who has worked his butt off. Amen. God is using many people, and I'll tell you what, we need more workers in the church. We don't have enough. We need more workers, amen? So we need to get up and start doing something for the Lord. Amen. 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 So now here, here comes one of the good parts. You know, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of us here tonight, and money has been spent to make this happen. It's not free. You know, praise God for Brother Jimbo out there that's bought a lot of stuff, and he's using this time to have that barbecue, and he's going to bless you tonight. But it's not free. We come together so that we can be able to see those that have come tonight to be blessed and to be saved. But it takes money because we did this for them. We did this for you. So tonight, if you go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, uh, 633, it says, Therefore, oh, one thing I'm going to tell you. How many of you are going to McDonald's, Jack in the Box, and the prices are up there? You know, when I go up there and I pay for my food, and then it shows on the register, tip, 10%, 15%, 20%, I feel like telling them, you know what? I'm already paying your $20 an hour. Because it's not the employer that's paying it, it's me. The employer don't lose nothing, but I do. But I'll tell you what, God's willing to... Uh, to meet our needs. Amen? And uh, it says here, Therefore I tell you, Hey, we're going to do it whichever way. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body. Or about your body, For, I lost my place now. I let it start all over. Therefore, I'll tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or your body, what you will wear. You know, I started praying, and I started asking God, what's going on with this world that they keep lifting up our prices? You know, I believe they're doing it on purpose. I don't think that we're running out of nothing. 
if God feeds the birds of the field and dresses the lilies of the field, why is he not going to take care of his children? Amen? He's going to take care of us. And I started thinking and praying about it, and God started showing me something. You know that old Pharaoh, Biden, the one that's in the White House today, that's doing all these things, that's going against the things of God? You know, he's making it tough for us. But I'll tell you what, I started, started praying, God started showing me that we are walking in the light. They might be walking in the darkness, and they might do whatever they do, raise prices of our gas and food and all that stuff. But I'll tell you what, God is not going to let you go. He's going to take care of you. He's going to be with you. He's going to bless you. Amen. Just thank God that he doesn't put his prices on tithing higher. He only asks for a 10%. That's all he's asking you for. And what happens? He blesses your money that you go out to the store. It seems like you pay these outrageous prices. But then again, you get more and your money lasts longer. That's what's been going on in my life. You know, I don't run out of nothing because he said that he will take care of my needs. Amen. I want a low rider, but I, I might not get that. But he's taking care of my needs. Amen. And he's going to take care of your needs. No matter what the price is, if they go up, you know, I got a brother in the house, Pastor Bobby, he told me some stories of when they didn't have nothing, no baby formula in their cupboards. And they would pray and they would go into that cupboard and there was baby formula for the next day. You know, that's the God that we serve. So tonight I want to tell you, if you're going through something, I talked to a sister tonight that needs a job, and I know that God could give her a job. You know why I know? Because I'm going to tell you what happened with my daughter. She was working at a company. They let her go that day, and she was upset, and she told me, God doesn't answer prayers. I said, yes, he does. I've been praying for you. God's going to give you a, a job at UCI. That same day that she lost her job, about two hours later, UCI called her and said, you have a job. Amen. I told her, God doesn't answer prayers? Yes, he does. Amen. And you know, you need to start declaring the word of God upon your life. You start to declaring that God's going to meet your need, and you're going to see him meet your need. Amen. Because our God never fails. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Well, we're done. Uh, could I have the ushers and usherettes, please? If you need an envelope, raise up your hand, and we'll give you one. Yeah, we also got Tylee, if you, I, I don't know if they're going to put it up back there, if you. Back there we got somebody. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we just come before you tonight. We want to thank you for your presence in this place. We want to thank you for all that you have done these three days. And Lord, you're not finished. There's more that you're going to do tonight, Father. We pray that you break the chains off of people, Father God. We pray, Father God, that you would deliver them tonight, Father, from their addictions, Father God, and everything that you know about them, Lord. I pray that they will open up their hearts, let you into those dark areas, that you would set them free, Father God, and that they would come to you tonight. Father, a brand new person, Father God, as they receive you as the Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you. We thank you for these tithes. We pray that, Father God, this conference will be met, Father God, with these tithes and the offerings, Father. And we just thank you for your people that are here tonight. May you bless them, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, how many of you guys have been here all three nights? Behind the table, boys. Behind the table. Behind the table. On the stage, behind the table. Over there. Probably should have gone that way. It's a weird, weird way we're doing that. Um, hey, so how many people have been here all three nights? Let me see, let me see some hands. Don't act like we're shy all of a sudden. Come on. Okay. So if you've been here all three nights, you probably know what's about to happen. But if you haven't, then you're about to be surprised. Hopefully. Back a little farther. All right. 
I got a little illustration for you guys tonight. Okay, so you know what we do every day? We go through we go through life Ow. and we're attempting to argue. Sorry, my flesh wants something. I do it today is we're trying to deal with two. Can I have a bite? Mm -hmm. oh, wow. All right, come on. Oh, is that? I bought your finger, huh? We're trying to deal with two parts of our. I'm not ready for a bite. I'm not. We're trying to deal with two parts of ourselves our flat. Okay, all right, I just want one bite. Fine, whatever. Our flesh and our spirit. I'm going to pour some water. Ow. Each other. It's a, a constant thing. Every, no, no, not... It's a constant. It's a constant issue in our lives because our flesh wants to do whatever it wants to do, and our spirit wants to fuck. Oh, oh my! Can we not? Can we? Every time I go to read the Bible, literally every time, I get. I get distracted by my flesh. And I don't know what to do about it because it's part of me and it doesn't want to follow God. It doesn't want to follow the spirit. Oh. 
It wants to follow the flesh. It doesn't want me reading my Bible and, and praying and speaking to you right now. Uh, Every time I want to pray and read the Bible, my flesh is distracting me. Oh, there it is. You tore a page out. Every time. Every time with my flesh. So my question to you today is, how do we deal with that constant struggle, flesh versus spirit? Anyone know? You're right. My, I am hungry, so I'm going to go get something to eat now. I hope the pastors have an answer because I don't. I <laughs> Pastor Chad, come on up, man. Come on up. All right, listen up. We're in a war. Whether you like it or not, whether you want to be in one or not, if you are a Christian, you're in a war. If you've been here these last few days, you know that one of the enemies that we're fighting against is the world. You know that we are surrounded by and bombarded by the values, the systems, the behaviors, the attitudes of this world that are so often contrary to the things of God. If you've been here, you know that one of the things we fight against is the devil, always at work trying to discourage us, defeat us, deceive us. But there's something else that we fight against. It's not just the enemy on the outside, but so often it's the enemy on the inside. It's our very own flesh. We fight against our own flesh. And so here's the thing, as a Christian, when you become a Christian, something profound happens. Something amazing happens. And if you're a Christian here, you, you know what I'm talking about. You become born again. You get a new heart. Your spirit that was once dead is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You get a new nature that actually wants to serve God, actually wants to do the right thing. The old passes away, and we become made new. That's amazing news, but as Christians, so often what happens is we still find ourselves giving into sinful things, giving into temptations, doing things that we know we shouldn't be doing. How can a Christian, how can someone who is born again, someone with a new spirit, Someone with a new heart, a new nature, still do some of the things that we do and say some of the things that we say. Think some of the things that we think. How can someone with a new heart still harbor resentment and bitterness and hatred, racism? How can someone with a brand new nature that wants to serve God still choose, like deliberately choose, to do something that we know we shouldn't do. 
How can we be made new and still lie and steal and cheat? How can we indulge in pornography? How can we cut corners and compromise just to get ahead? How can we say such mean and hurtful things to other people? And the truth is, we can't just blame the world. We can't just blame the devil. So often, the reason we do these things is because our flesh wants to do it. Our flesh wants to do it. The truth is, we are made new on the inside. We are absolutely changed on the inside. But we still live in these corrupted bodies, with corrupted minds, corrupted by this fallen world, corrupted by our own history of sin, all the habits and things that you've done all those years, have corrupted these bodies, this flesh. And so as long as we're in this body, we're fighting this war against ourselves. On the inside, we're changed. But on the outside, we're corrupted. And there's a war. Because my corrupted side wants to do things that are often selfish and sinful. And on the inside, I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to do the right thing. I want to live for God. And here's the thing. You have to understand this. God did not save you so that you could spend the rest of your life struggling with sin. God did not save you so that you could spend the rest of your life giving in to temptations and stuck in, in addictions and habits that are not good for you. God did not save us to be stuck in a life of sin. He wants us to, to step away from our old ways. He wants us to be free. Free, like really free. When he saved us, we know that the Bible tells us that he justifies us. That he no longer looks at us as murderers, as adulterers, as addicts, as thieves. He sees us as holy, righteous, children. And every moment that we're alive, he's transforming us to be on the outside how he already sees us on the inside. So the question is, how do we walk in this? Like, how do we walk in that kind of freedom? How do we fight the war against the flesh? How do we overcome these temptations? How do we wrestle against this thing? Because for sure we know this, God still hates sin. We know Ephesians uh, 4.22 says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. How do we do these things? I, real quickly, I'm going to talk about three things, three real practical things that we could do. First one is this. Stop feeding the flesh. Stop feeding the flesh. The, desire, the desires of our flesh are so often contrary to the things of God. Can I tell you something? Maybe it's just me. But I find that our flesh typically wants to do things that are pretty selfish, pretty sinful. I think the flesh wants to lust after something that's not ours. Someone who's not ours. I think the flesh wants us to lie out of self-preservation. I, I think that the flesh wants us to cut down other people, make ourselves feel good about ourselves. I, I think that the flesh wants to do these things that are so often contrary to God. And so one of the things we have to do is we're going to win this war against the flesh is we've got to stop feeding it. Stop giving it what it wants. When the flesh wants to lust, don't feed it. Don't give it what it wants. When it wants to lie, don't feed it. Stop giving the flesh what it's asking for. Starve it to death. Starve it to death. Romans 6.13 says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Listen, the more we feed the flesh, the more we give in to our fleshly desires, the stronger those desires become. You have to starve it to death. Stop feeding it. Starve it to death. Crucify your flesh. Put it to death. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What does that look like? It means when my flesh wants to be bitter and hateful, I'm not going to feed it what it wants. I'm going to choose to forgive. I'm going to choose to love. It means that when my flesh wants to gossip, slander, I'm not going to give it what it wants. 
matter how it feels. I'm not going to give it what it wants. I'm going to choose to be honest. I'm going to choose to love. When my flesh wants to lust, I'm not going to feed it. I'm going to starve it. I'm going to choose to look away. I'm going to choose to think something else. I'm not going to give in to what it wants. When my flesh wants to give in to an addictive habit, an addictive behavior, I'm going to choose to say no. When whatever my flesh wants, when my flesh wants to covet, whenever it wants to do anything that is contrary to God, I'm going to starve it. I'm not going to feed it. Listen, the more you feed the flesh, the harder it is to say no to it. Come on. I was just, uh, we were just talking because uh, the other day, I felt like I was really hungry coming home from uh, basketball practice. I was really hungry. I was like, man, I just ate like a couple hours ago. I feel like I need a whole new meal. But previously, we had been on the road for like, you know, eight hour stretch and I wasn't, I didn't get that hungry at all the whole way. And what's going on? Oh, because I was eating on a four hour cycle, my body wanted to eat. The more you feed your flesh, the more you give into it, the harder it is going to be to say no. But that, the flip side is also true. The less you feed the flesh, the easier it becomes to say no. Stop feeding the flesh. Here's another thing. We need to change the way we think. You see, fighting in the war against the flesh is not just about uh, self-denial. It's not willpower. It's not, okay, I'm just going to say no. I mean, th there's something to be said about that. Yeah, definitely stop feeding the flesh. But let me tell you something. Ultimately, our actions... Our behaviors, our character, is a result of the way that we think. Everything you do on the outside ultimately finds its root on what you're thinking on the inside. The temptations of the flesh begin in the mind. Romans 8, verses 5 and 6 says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. That's why Romans 12, 2 would say, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, our minds play a pretty crucial role in spiritual war. Science and technology will tell us that the brain is incredibly powerful. That every thought that you think, every thought that you entertain actually creates neural pathways. That the more that you think a certain thought, the stronger those pathways become in your brain. And so it becomes easier for your brain to think that same thing over and over again. Which ultimately controls who we are and what we do. The thoughts that we think, the thoughts that we think ultimately determine our character, our values, our behavior, our thoughts control who we are and what we do. So when we entertain certain thoughts, man, look at that girl. Whew. When we entertain these thoughts and we keep thinking the same thought over and over and over again, those thoughts become more powerful in our brain. It becomes easier to think that way and it changes who we are, changes our character, changes our values changes our behavior. So if we're going to fight against the flesh, we're not just saying no to it, but we got to start thinking different things. we got to cut it off at the root. Instead of dwelling on sinful thoughts and letting these things take root in our brain, we've got to rebuke these things. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive obey Christ. It's also probably why the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 that whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Or Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 that says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. If we want to win this war against the flesh, it's not just willpower, it's not just saying no, but we need to start changing the way that we think. We need to fill our minds with God's truth, think over passages of scripture, sit and dwell on God's word. This is God's strategy. God knew about the brain way before technology and science ever proved that that's how the brain works. That's why his word tells us these things, but we can renew our minds.
and we can create positive, holy neural pathways in our brain so that I'm no longer thinking those negative thoughts. And, and you'll realize it. Maybe you grew up thinking a certain thought. Maybe you grew up reminding yourself over and over again that you're a failure. Maybe you remind yourself over and over again that I mean nothing. I'm worthless. I'm dumb. I'm an idiot. If, if any of you have ever thought that, I guarantee it, it gets stronger and stronger. And the, and the longer you let that sit and dwell, I'm not talking about like, you know, for an hour I sit and think that, but I mean like over time, you keep thinking that same thought and it keeps being reminded, it becomes easier and easier and easier. But the same is true when we think holy thoughts. Start reminding ourselves of scripture. And so we keep thinking God is good, God is good, God is good, God is good. And you know what, pretty soon, my default is God is good. It doesn't matter what happens, that's my default. That's what my brain says. So what does it look like? Well, instead of repeating crazy thoughts, like, man, that person's, whew, that person, oh, man. When you get hit with those thoughts, probably nobody here, you don't think like that, I'm sure. Yeah, that's the other church. I'm at the wrong conference. But instead of thinking those kinds of thoughts, we've got to hijack those thoughts. We've got to learn how to cut that off as soon as that thought comes. But not just rebuke the thought, we gotta fill it, we gotta replace it with a better thought. Maybe scripture, maybe it's scripture, maybe we turn to like 1 Corinthians 6.18 that says, flee from sexual immorality. And so I can constantly remind myself, maybe I keep dealing with this stupid thought that wants me to lust after something, someone that's not mine. So I can keep filling my mind and say, you know what? Flee from sexual immorality, flee from sexual immorality. You might look crazy, but I'll tell you what, you're gonna change. You might feel like, what the heck am I doing? What am I doing? I'll tell you what you're doing is you're renewing your mind. By doing such, you're transforming it, it, it's wild how this happens. Instead of thinking over and over again, oh, that person hurt me. That person hurt me. That person said something. That person did me wrong. You know, pretty soon, you, you, all it's going to take is for you to hear their voice and you're going to be struck with all the things that they did. As soon as we get those thoughts, we gotta hijack them. Maybe we remind ourselves of a scripture like Ephesians 4:32. Forgive one another. As God has forgiven me. Forgive, as God's forgiven me. Forgive. As God has forgiven me. So it's not just I'm gonna reject the thought, but I'm gonna replace it with a better thought. And I'm gonna repeat that thought over and over again until it sinks in because I want it to sit in my brain. I don't want to forget it. Does that make sense? So we need to stop feeding the flesh, but we also need to replace it with good thoughts, holy thoughts. Eventually, it'll change our actions and our values and our character. It'll literally be transformed from the inside out. The more we think that thought, I'm going to tell you something. As those pathways get formed in your brain, your flesh is going to start desiring different things. You can change the what your flesh desires. Right now, today, your flesh desires that drug. Today, your flesh desires that person. Today, your flesh desires lying or whatever it is. I'll tell you what, tomorrow we don't have to desire that. You can be free from that. This is not willpower. This is not just human, you know, reasoning or strategy. This is God's stuff. This is God's way. We are renewed from the inside. And the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to say no and allow our corrupted, messed up bodies to be transformed from the inside. Now, I'm not saying this. We need to lean on each other. This is important. Because you know what? In a lot of churches, a lot of churches are not places of, they're not places of trust. A lot of churches are not places of trust. places of honesty. A lot of people come to church and they pretend. A lot of people come to church and they lie and they hide. They're afraid that that person's going to judge me. That person's going to think that. That person's going to say this. Can I tell you something? It's good. Yes, absolutely good that you have God. It's absolutely good that you have the Holy Spirit. But God has also given you each other. God has given us each other. That's God's way. We need each other. We absolutely need each other. We need to be able to call somebody and say, you know what? I need help. I need prayer. We need to be able to
able to talk to somebody about temptations, about the struggles, about the battle. We need to stop hiding. Stop pretending. One of the greatest weapons we have against the in the spiritual war, especially against fighting the flesh, is community. It's each other. Can I tell you something? I guarantee that if you were to be sitting right now next to your pastor, there's no way you're going to open up your phone or get on a computer and start looking at pornography. There's no way. There's no, I, there's no way. I, you, some of you guys are pretty crazy, but you're, there's no way. Here's the problem. For some of us, the people we surround ourselves with, they make it too easy for us to do things that are contrary to God. For some of us, it's the fact that we're not around anybody that gives us the freedom to do things that are contrary to God. Lean on each other. Find somebody that you can be, that could give you support and accountability and encouragement and prayer. Be that to somebody else. Let somebody lean on you. Don't judge them. Don't talk about them. Don't share all the stuff that they told you. Receive people. Help people. Help each other. This is God's plan. This is God. Lean on each other. Listen. <laughs> For some of you people, for some of us, we just need to find somebody that we can just call up and say, you know what, I'm struggling. You know what, right now I feel this temptation to do this, and I just need to be around somebody. Anybody that's ever worked through addictions or anything like that, you know the importance of accountability like that. Just come hang around. I, hang, I promise you won't be tempted to do those kinds of things. It just doesn't work like that. So let me close with this. We're in a war. A real war. And the flesh is an absolutely real enemy. And we have a choice tonight, as we do every day. We could choose to be like a lot of Christians in this country, a lot of Christians in this world. And we could decide that we're not going to have any active plan for fighting against the flesh. We're just going to go with it. And we'll live like so many Christians in this world and we'll struggle with sin, and we'll give in to temptation, and we'll live a life of regret and disappointment, and you'll never discover the fullness of what God has for you. But if you want to be everything God's called you to be, if you want to do all that God has called you to do, you need to be intentional about fighting your flesh about being renewed from the inside out, about letting what's happened on the inside change what's happening on the outside. So here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Will you be a Christian who is transformed from the inside out? Or will you be a Christian on the inside only? The choice is yours. Oh, come on, don't stop praising him. Come on. I said, don't stop praising him. Come on, come on, come on. I said, don't stop praising him. Come on. You see, uh, I don't believe in just having normal church. You see, I, I like to look at the, the book of Acts. How they said they went um, to the upper room. And they said that they not only just had service... But they had some church. You know, it's not all about the hype or anything like that. But I, I, I believe that when we get together with believers, something on the inside has to die. Mm, I don't know. Uh, maybe... maybe I don't know. Maybe they're not catching it. You know, we're, we're you know we're talking about the the spiritual warfare against the flesh. The flesh is real. You know, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in a place 
where the flesh is always growing. And whatever you're feeding, eventually it's going to grow. And as Pastor Chad even mentioned, he said, what are you feeding? My question to you is, are you feeding the spirit man or are you feeding the flesh? You see, we come to church, we praise God, but on the inside, we're dead. Praise God. Appreciate you guys. We just flow. Praise the Lord. You know, we come to church and we have this mindset that I go to church once a week and it becomes traditional and religious that nothing actually changes. And so we have to get to a point in our life where we crucify the flesh. I want you to turn to somebody on the side and say, crucify the flesh. Oh, come on. You, you guys can do better than that. Turn to the other side and say, crucify the flesh. No, no. Crucify the flesh. You see, what happens when you begin to crucify the flesh, you no longer begin to crave the things of the world. Come on. But you find yourself one of the things of the spirit and one of the things of God. You see, we have a lot of church, religion, but we don't have a lot of Holy Spirit move. You see, I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost that even when I go to the store, they say there's somebody, something different about that person. I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost that, uh, my goodness, you know, Peter was so full of the Holy Ghost that he walked by people and his shadow began to heal people. I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost that somebody says, what was that? I felt something, something shifted on the inside, and I'm seeing the outward effect. Listen, it's not just what changes on the inside, because a lot of times people, they come to church, and hopefully I don't mess up the camera angles, but they come to church, and they allow God to do an inside movement, an inside job, but they don't let him change the outward. That's why you see a lot of people still talking the same, dressing the same. Listen, I don't, know, I don't know about you, but somebody that really gets a hold of God and the Holy Spirit encounters them, they don't look the same. They don't act the same. They don't talk the same. They don't dress the same. Listen, I don't know about you, but when I first got saved in 2009, I did it all. I was a gang member. I was on drugs. I was, you name it. But the moment the presence of God encountered me, everything changed. You see, we live in a generation where people, they want to look churchy, but they don't want to change. My goodness. You see, we know that in this life, we're going to have some war against the flesh. Somebody say amen. Amen. You see, it might look like fighting temptation or fighting, holding our tongue the way that we talk to some people. Ah, oh, got quiet. You see, how do you speak to somebody that will tell you when somebody cuts you off on the freeway, how you react? Is the flesh higher than the spirit, or does your spirit rise up and say, well, bless them, I'm going to pray for them anyway. You see, you know it's a spiritual warfare when it's no longer anything that you can fix in the natural, because it only takes place in the supernatural it can only be fixed by the holy spirit you see the bible says in second corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 it says it is true we live in a body of flesh say we live in a body of flesh but we do not fight like people of the world verse 4 we do not use those things to fight What the world uses, we use the things God gives us to fight with, and they have power. Say power. Come on, say power. 
those things that God gives us to fight would destroy the strong places of the devil. Verse 5, we break down every thought and proud thing that puts itself up against the wisdom of God. We take hold of every thought and make it obey Christ. We are ready to punish. Say, we're ready to punish. We are, come on, you could do it better. I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't come to a dry place. I came to church. Come on. It says, my goodness, mm. Jesus, the things that God gives us to fight will destroy the strong places of the devil. We break down every thought and proud thing that puts itself up against the wisdom of God. We take hold of every thought and make it obey Christ. Listen, we are ready to punish those who will not obey as soon as you obey in everything. I like how the King James Version says it in 2 Corinthians 10, 4. It says, for the weapons, say for the weapons, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Come on. You see, God gave you authority by how you speak, and you can cast, cast that thought down. You see, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask with the wrong motives. Didn't Jesus say, he said, the same work that I do, shall you do also and greater work. Okay, so why are we walking around bent out of shape and letting the devil rule our mind? You see, God has given us dominion and power over the things of the enemy. So whenever the devil comes to try to bring anxiety and allow that flesh to try to rise, you ought to say, ah, devil, I cast you down and I bring you under submission into the obedience of Christ. You see, a lot of times people just let the devil run, run their life and mess with their minds and they just take it. You know, I, I, you know I, I've been in Praise Chapel. I got saved under the fellowship. And I remember just seeing many people that were gang members, many people that were hooked on drugs, being transformed by God. And I remember seeing them one way. I was one of them. If somebody look at us, we'll one-up them, right? But then we come to Jesus, and it seems like the authority that we once had, we no longer have. We become weak. You see, the same authority that you use in the world, you ought to use towards the devil. You see, now let, let's not get all religious and spiritual here and be like, oh, brother, you shouldn't be talking. about." Why not? Didn't Jesus say that I've given you authority to trample over serpents? He said that you will cast out devils in my name. You will prophesy. You will speak to the dry bones and they'll come alive. Then why are we allowing the devil to have a footstool in our life? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. God has given you a weapon. He's given you the Holy Ghost. He's given you the Word of God. You know, a lot of times people, they go through the warfare and the trials and the testing, and all they do is complain instead of taking it to God. You see, God has given us authority to call things that be not as though they were. Let me help somebody out. Though they were means already done. You see, I, I like it because when we pull down strongholds, that's letting us know that the very thoughts that the devil has placed within us, we don't have to deal with it anymore. You know, I, I noticed this figure over here uh, trapped in a cage. And as I was sitting here, I got this revelation that the Lord gave me. You see, uh, you get, when you're a preacher, you get revelation for everything, right? You, get, you, go to the, you go to the market, you see some fruit, and you're like, oh, fruits of the Spirit, right? I see this thing on the side, and he's here in the jail, and he's, he's thinking about his life. I don't know. Uh, but I thought about it. What happens when you take your thoughts that are negative, you take them captive and place them into the obedience of Christ. What happens is, is this is a perfect example, when you say these thoughts are not mine. 
this negative thinking is not mine. I cast it down. Whenever we cast it down and put it into the obedience of Christ, the Bible says that when we put it under subjection, those thoughts leave. This man is captured, right? He's caged. He's in bondage. You know, the devil wants your mind to be in bondage, but you have the authority. But no, no, no. This isn't of God. I cast you down. I rebuke you, and you got to go. You see, when we rebuke and we come against the lies of the enemy, what happens is, is he gets captured and he's stuck. He can't come back anymore. But a lot of times, we allow the lies of the enemy to come, and we don't do anything about it. You see, I, lo I love uh, to be very transparent. You know, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, I, I work for, as a CNA, and uh, you can just feel the oppression whenever you're walking through, through the halls. People that are depressed, people that are feeling lonely, you, you just feel it. And I remember, I, and, I, and I start noticing that whenever I lack sleep, the devil likes to mess with my mind. I never dealt with anxiety until I lost, you know, I realized I didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> I remember walking in the hallways, and I realized my mind started to just overthink. My heart began to just pump overly. And... I remember I drank some coffee and I had some espresso and I had something to do with it and the lack of sleep. So the devil, you know, he's, he's, a, he's an emotional guy. And so he likes to play with our emotions. And so my heart's racing and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I had too much caffeine. Uh, I need to, you know, I need to uh, calm down a little bit. And so I'm walking and then you ever have anxiety for, uh, you have anxiety for thinking about having anxiety? You start worrying because you're worrying, and then you start worrying because you stop worrying. It was almost one of those. So I'm walking, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, like, something's wrong with me. I'm about to have a heart attack, and I'm thinking the worst. I said, oh, my goodness, I done did it. I probably had too much cake the other day, and now I got diabetes, and I'm thinking the worst. And I'm, I start feeling fatigued. My mind is racing, everything is spinning, and I said, oh, Lord, what do I got to do? I said, you know, I'm leaving work early. I, I can't do this. So I told my boss, I'm going to the ER. I'm going to check myself in. I'm sure I got diabetes. I got this. I got that. I, I feel like I'm going to ha have a heart attack. The devil is a lie, right? So <laughs> we'll blame that one on the devil. So I go to the ER, and, and I'm, my mind's racing, and I'm can't even talk, and I'm telling him, yeah, this is wrong with me, this is wrong with me. I'm saying, calm down, you know, take a deep breath, and I'm like, all right, all right, all right I'm going to try. They have me lay down, they, they take uh, blood work out of me, or, or they do blood work, they take blood, like two, two tubes, and um, they come back like 30, 45 minutes later, and they said, honey, you're good. They said, you're so healthy, you're not even a borderline diabetic. They said, do you deal with anxiety? And I was like, I think so. And they said, what happens is you were having a panic attack, and your mind told you that you were going to die. And because you were thinking on it, it you felt worse. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, like that lie. Imagine if I would have just got that, that lie and be like, you know what, devil? You're a liar. I place it into the obedience of Christ, and I rebuke it. Now, I'm not standing up here and acting like I'm all spiritually built and be like, oh, I got this all packed together. Listen, I go through some things, too. All right, and so I should have caught it, but instead I was in my emotions, all right? And so uh, a lot of times we get so filled up with our emotions that we forget, to, we forget to pray. We forget to add Jesus to it. And so I'm like, all right, I'm good. I end up going home. I'm cleaning up, and then I didn't get no rest at this time. I'm still, you know. Uh, running on three hours of sleep and still got caffeine in, inside my lungs or in my blood. And um, here comes those thoughts again. I start feeling fatigue, start spinning, everything gets blurry, and there's the devil again. Oh, you got diabetes. Oh, you got this. You got that. And, but this time, I caught it. And I was like, devil, I rebuke you. I was like, I just came back from the hospital. They said I'm good. And I realized the moment I captured those thoughts and put it into the obedience of Christ, 
everything left my mind. I stopped feeling shaky. My vision was like 20 20. I'm like, my goodness, I don't need glasses. <laughs> Everything cleared up. And I'm thinking, wow, it was just that easy. All I had to do was rebuke the devil and he'll flee. Yeah. Right? You see, God gave us authority by how we speak. You can cast those thoughts down. You know, I love what the Bible says. You know, a lot of times, people, they complain and they go on Facebook and they complain to everybody else except God. And the only thing that they need is the Word of God. You know what Bible stands for, B-I-B-L-E? Basic instructions before leaving earth. It's our guideline, right? And so a lot of times, we're just, God, what do I do? How do I pray? It's in this Bible. You see, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Right? In the power of his might. Romans 13, 12 says, the night is, for, is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Oh, hold on now. Catch how it said the armor of light. Huh, the armor of light. Huh, let me go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Listen, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So we're going to stop there really quick. And let me, let me help somebody today. He said, put on the armor of light. What is the armor of light? We read it here, the armor of God. So it's the mentality, our character. When it's saying to put on the armor of God, it's saying to change your character and put on Christ. Why does it say take on the helmet of salvation? The first thing the devil does in attack is the mind. What does he do? The devil does two things. He always mocks God and tries to imitate. So number one is God will always plant godly seeds. What does the devil do? He plants corruptible seeds. So he always starts with the seed of thoughts. So whenever it goes in your mind, eventually you're going to start thinking about it. So it says put on the helmet of salvation. Why? Because the helmet of salvation is to remind yourself, listen, I'm saved by the grace of God through faith. Whenever the devil comes and tells me, you're not saved, you're not born again. No, no, I cast this thought down because I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by the grace of God through faith. So I protect my mind. The second, it says the breastplate of righteousness. Why does it say that? Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if it goes in from your mind and you capture it and you begin to overthink, guess where it goes? It goes to the heart. That's why the Bible says that out of the abundance of your heart, whatever is in your heart, eventually is going to come out. So whatever you're feeding, eventually that's going to flow out. The Bible says, therefore take up the bout of truth, right? Or before that, the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. Why? Knowing that when the lies of the enemy are coming, I stand in faith, knowing I got the word of God, I'm standing in position, I'm blocking every thought that is coming that is negative, and I don't receive it. I stand in faith. 
Then it goes into the belt of truth. Why? The belt of truth, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So when you receive the word and you're guarded in truth, nothing can shake you. You see, you ever wear big pants without a belt? It's just uncomfortable. They're always falling. You got to lift them up. When you are guarded with a belt, nothing's coming down, right? So whenever you're guarded in truth, in the word of God, nothing can shake you and pull you down. Then it says, therefore, take on the sandals of peace. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me, and his rat and his staff, they comfort me. When I'm going through the dark place, I still got peace. When I'm going through the trials and the testing, I'm still walking in peace, knowing that my focus and my mind is on God. Knowing that even though I'm walking through these dark seasons, these dark trials in my wilderness, I still got joy and I got peace because I got the preparation of peace. And even though I'm walking in the darkness, I'm still in that marvelous light and God is going to keep me in perfect peace and my mind is going to be stayed on him. Nothing will shake me. Nothing will move me because my focus is on God. Christ. Lastly, it says, therefore, somebody say, therefore, take up the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I don't know about you, but the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, come on. Ah, let me look this up because I want to make sure I get you the right scripture. Praise the Lord. It says in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick. Say quick. So you're telling me that if I read the word, something quickly is going to happen. Uh-oh. And it says, and powerful. Uh-oh. So if I read the word, something quick is going to happen and follow, there's power. Right? Let's read a little more. And it says, it's sharper, somebody say sharper, than any two-edged sword. That means it'll pierce even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Uh Uh-oh, so that means that this word of God pierces really deep. That means it's quick. Something happens right away. It's powerful. That means it's backed up with some dunamis power, explosive power, that dynamite power, and that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It has two edges on the front and on the back, and it pierces far past my heart, even through soul and spirit. Don't you know the word of God changes their very character from walking in the flesh to walking in the spirit? That's why the Lord said to walk in the spirit at all times and you will not gratify the lust of the flesh. Somebody shout amen. The Bible says that the word of God is a discerner Oh, to serve, that means it knows the intention of a person's heart and the characteristics of how they are. So that means that the Bible not only just gets inside of us, but it changes us, it cuts something up on the inside, and allows me to walk in one way and leave another way. Because the Bible says that the Word of God it knows the intent of the heart and changes my heart. Therefore, I'm no longer walking in the flesh, but walking in the spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. My goodness. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We read this scripture... And we think, oh, because I'm a man and woman of God, I can talk to whoever the way I want. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but no. The Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and against the powers of the present darkness and against spiritual forces 
of evil in the heavenly places. Whenever the devil uses somebody, you ought to automatically think that's not them. It's the devil behind them. Remember, we don't wrestle. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the rulers of darkness. Whenever somebody is not born again and saved, the devil has possession over them and uses them to plant negative seed. Therefore, we have to remind ourselves this person is not serving God. They're going to act like the world. You know, a lot of times people, uh, especially Christians, we look at the world and they do evil things. We're like, how dare they? Wow, do you see what the world, do you see how they're acting? They're part of the world. We ought to pray against that. If you want to walk in the spirit, you got to drown the flesh. Some of you don't need deliverance. You need discipline. God never intended for you to go from deliverance to deliverance. He said, I'll take you from glory to glory. It's not the devil telling you to pick up the Snickers bar. It's your flesh. If you can't have authority over your flesh, that means you've got to fast. Fasting removes us from our sinful nature and our flesh to get our minds back on the things of God. When's the last time you fasted? You know, you, you, you know when it's time to fast when you start getting upset for the little things. You know it's time to fast when you're getting mad at the preacher for speaking the truth. You know it's time to fast when you're thinking about the barbecue and saying, when is this man going to stop preaching? You know it's time to fast when you can't push the plate to the side and say, God, just one more hour. God says, can't you not keep walks for one hour? Oh, but we want to say, God, five minutes of praise, five minutes of worship. Where is that one that was stretched out at the altar and said, I'm not leaving till I get my breakthrough. I'm not leaving till I get my deliverance. I'm not leaving till this flesh dies. God, I want a miracle. I want to be set apart and used for your glory. We have to change the way that we think. If we can have that table come back out with the water jug and the water cup. You see, whatever we feed, it's going to grow. Just like the same way, whoever you hang around with, eventually you're going to act like them. Why? It's because the influence. Some of you, I'm going to get a lot of haters and a lot of people that are mad. Some of you think you're possessed by an evil spirit when you just need discipline to be removed from that surrounding. Listen, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. They can only be influenced. And a lot of times, believers are influenced to hang around the wrong people and say, I'm going to save them at the bar. The devil is a liar. You know where you're there. Your flesh is saying, just tell them this story, and I'll get them saying, no, baby, you just want to be in there and have a little, oh, just one time, God, just one more time. Oh, you can't live like the devil. <laughs> Come on. Monday through Saturday, and on Sunday, lift holy hands. If you're in this thing, you ought to be in all the way. Come on. If we could fill that more up, like all the way to the brim. We got to make up our mind on who we are and whose we are. There's a lot of people that are Christians. They know that they're a Christian, but they don't know whose they are. Because the devil is always messing with them. And if they deal with anxiousness, oh, you got anxiety. If they deal with the spirit of heaviness, oh, you got depression. No, we are the righteousness of Christ. We are a peculiar people, God's very own possession. That's why the devil can't possess you, because you're God's very own possession. You've been bought with a price. This is why I say 
you don't need deliverance. You need discipline. Discipline that flesh and put it under subjection that whenever the devil tries to rise, you say, I'm not going down that street anymore. I done went over there already and I found myself in the pits, but I realized that with God, he'll bring me into a place where I'll be delivered. Philippians 4.13, I could do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. It never said I could do all things through myself. No, you've been doing it all along. That's why you fall short. I could do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Somebody shout hallelujah. You see, we see here this cup. And a lot of times this is our mind filled with junk. A lot of times we're filled with negativity. We're filled with all kinds of things, the cares of the world, our own mindset, our own flesh. But if you was just to get in the presence of God, God will crucify the flesh. You see, this water here represents the Holy Spirit. You see, this is our mind full of chaos, full of flesh, full of pride, full of life, full of the cares of the world. All we need is a little bit of Jesus. You ever been in a season where your mind is just racing? And the moment you get in the presence of God, something changes? Why is that? It's because God takes those things that are in your mind and he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness and says, try me first. So what happens is, as we get a little bit of Jesus, and we say, thank you, Lord. And we, we realize, God, I'm pressing in. God, I'm doing all that I can. But yet, we're still floating in our mind. And then we complain and say, God, I did it all. God's not working. Sometimes, the Bible says, to seek and knock. Why? Because you ever have somebody knock on your door and they just won't go away? They just keep knocking and knocking. Eventually, they're going to open up the door, right? Jesus said, you got to be persistent when you knock. you got to be persistent in your prayer. So, if you're knocking and saying, Jesus, I can't do this. I need your strength. Eventually, he's going to say, I hear you. Sometimes, God will take a step back and say, let me see how much they really trust me. Let me just stay silent for a season. Let me just stay silent for a moment to see if it's just their flesh. Because half the time, when God intervenes, we thank him for a moment. But when everything is good, we turn our backs on God. And we say, I'm good, God. Thank you. And now we're in spiritual adultery. Because we're treating it like a marriage where you're not really putting all you're in. You're not putting all of yourself in. So we're finding ourselves in spiritual adultery. So what happens is even though you're pressing in, your mind is so full of these thoughts, you got to persevere. The Bible says the one that endures to the end shall be saved. Okay, so I'm knocking, knocking, knocking. That's why the Bible says be persistent in your prayer. Uh-oh. Persistent means don't stop. So, God, I notice, and it's going to get a little wet here, so if we get some towels and stuff. Lord, I need you. God, I need your strength. So he pours into us. It's almost there, God. It's almost out. I still need to be persistent. If you continue pushing through and continue seeking the Lord, eventually he's going to fill your cup, not to the brim. What does the Bible say? That it's going to overflow. So if it overflows, my cup runneth over. My anxiety is gone. My depression is gone. It's drowned out because God has saved me and changed me. And I'm clear-minded because I put my trust and faith in Christ. 
Don't listen to the flesh when the flesh says you've done all that you could. That's what the flesh is saying. This is why I walk in the spirit at all times and I don't gratify the lust of my flesh because my flesh will lie and say you're good where you need to be. No, no, no. I need God, so I'm going to press until I receive my breakthrough. There's many you're here tonight, and you're saying, man, I've been going through this spiritual warfare. I've been going through this fight. I've been going through this mind battle, and it seems like the, the times I press in, I feel the peace of God, but then I feel like I take 10 steps back. You got to persevere. You got to press in. The one that endures to the end will be saved. I want to be saved, sanctified, full of the Holy Ghost. I got to endure. Sometimes God will allow the thorn in the flesh because he knows that if he removes it all, he knows that you'll praise him now because you're hurting and once it's gone, you'll forget about him. So sometimes God will leave the thorn in the flesh. But I ought to, you ought to say, God, I made it up in my mind today that whether I'm hurting, whether I'm going through it, I made it up in my mind that God I serve, for God I live, for God I have my being. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved, for God is on my side. You're in this place. You're saying, man, I've been going through torment. I've been going through spiritual warfare. Listen, you're not alone. Every believer is going to experience this thorn in the flesh. Every person is going to experience the, the war against the spirit in the flesh. But let me tell you something. Greater is he that is in you than he that overcame the world. With all tests. Jesus was pierced, crucified, and went through the same thing. But yet he rose up and he received the victory. Jesus said that you'll receive the victory as well. You're in this place. You're saying, man, I need a breakthrough in my life. I need a breakthrough in my mind. Listen, I want to pray with you. I know nowadays people don't do altar call, but I believe it's needed. Because I always tell God, let me not leave the altar until I receive my breakthrough. Let me, not, let me not leave that altar until I receive my freedom. Let me not leave that altar until I got a praise in my belly. Until I said, God, you delivered me out of the hands of the enemy. It's time, people of God, to make it up in your mind on what you're going to do. And even now, I want you to begin to examine yourself, examine your heart, and ask yourself, am I really in it for God? Or am I in it for what I can receive? Your flesh wants everything. But what good is it to profit the world yet lose your soul? There's a way that seems right to a man, but that way thereof is death. The only way is Jesus. The Bible says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. You can't go to heaven through any type of religion. It's only through Jesus. Why do you think the devil fights you in your mind so much? It's because he knows it's a narrow path that you've got to stay on. He knows that the moment you make it up in your mind, you can't be shaken. I want to pray now. You're in this place. You're saying, I need prayer. I need a breakthrough without hesitation, without limitation, without restriction. I want you by the count of three to just meet me at this altar. And I'm going to pray with you. One, two three come on up amen 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 hallelujah come on come on come on there's break the devil the devil wants you to stay in your seat god wants you to receive freedom tonight god wants you to receive breakthrough tonight hallelujah 
If you pray in tongues, I want you to pray boldly in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on, lift up your voice. Come on, praise chapel. Lift up your voice. Go on and praise God the way that you know how. Don't let the devil stop you of your praise. Don't let the devil stop you of your worship. Come on, pray boldly, pray boldly, pray boldly. If you pray in tongues, pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Come on. Lord, we thank you, God. And if we can have our ushers ready, the ones that are catching, because the Holy Spirit is about to move quickly. Uh, where's Pastor Brian? Brian, can you come up here, please? Shabada see that it is Shanda Yeshaba. Shama Mama Yeshanda Yeshaba. Shaba Mama Yeshanda Yeshaba. That's good. See in that atmosphere. Come on. Begin to pray boldly in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Shaba Yasi that it is Shanda Yeshaba. Shama Mama Yeshanda Yeshaba. Shama. Shama Mama Yeshanda Yeshaba. Ha Shanda Yeshaba. Shaba Mama Yeshaba. If you come over here, Pastor Ryan, you stand right here. I hear the Lord. I got a word for you that the Lord had given me. If I can have the catcher, whoever's helping, just lift your hand. I hear the Lord saying, he said, my son, you've been in a season where I'm stretching you. You've been in a season where I've placed you in an uncomfortable place so you can step out. And I hear the Lord saying, well done, for you are faithful. And I hear God saying, though you've been seeing even the spiritual attacks, the warfare against your family, against your finances, against your business, even against the, the church. But I hear God saying, because of the bold move that you stepped out in faith, I hear God saying, I'm going to take care of the rest. I hear the Lord saying, there's a sudden getting ready to come for your business. There's a suddenly getting ready to take place in your business. And I hear the Lord saying that even in your mind, you said, God, I'm not ready to step out. God, I don't want a title. God, I don't want to do this. But you said, God, I'll do it if you guide me, if you strengthen me. And because you said those words, the Lord said, son, I've heard your cry and I've heard your prayer. And I hear the Lord saying that he's blessing your home you and your wife. But the Lord said, no good thing do I withhold from those who walk upright with me. I hear God saying, son, I'm proud of you for stepping up. What seemed to be impossible years ago, six years ago, six months ago, God says it's possible now. For I've risen you even now. And the Lord said, I will use you for my glory. Don't be afraid to step out. But the Lord said, in this end time, I will use you greatly to raise up a young generation. That's why you have such influence on the young generation. Is because what I place on the inside of you, God says many will gravitate to you because my spirit lives within you. Father, I pray strengthen him in the name of Jesus. Even now.
the Lord said, you got to stop pressing in. For there comes a time where you press and press and press, and then eventually when it gets hard, you always take a step back. But this time you made it up your mind saying, God, I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to keep on pressing. And then once you made it up in your mind, God says, now I'll step in. Now I'll get to me. Touching Jesus' name. Shabbat 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 Shabbat
begin to worship. Can we begin to worship? I trust in God. I trust in God. Come on. Let's fill this place with the sound of worship. Forget about me. Forget about who's around you. Forget about the food. We're going to eat in a moment. Forget about who you came with. Focus on Jesus right now. Come on. We trust in God. Come on. Perfect submission. 